Hey, uh, thanks everyone for being here today. I'm going to talk about some open source host firmware directions. Um, so I used to use the qualifier host firmware. To, that's the firmware that runs on your host CPU as distinct from device firmware, the firmware that's running all the little tiny um, microcontrollers all over the place. And uh, I'm happy to get questions in the middle or at the end. Really no specific rule about interaction here. So I work at Intel. Been at Intel since uh, 97. Louder? No? No. Woo. Okay. You're doing good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, been at Intel since about uh, 1997 and started working on BIOS. And five years for that, before that, I'd worked on BIOS and firmware. And what really gets me excited um, early in my Life. My father had given me an um, open development board. It was an 8085 um, dev board, and it was great. It had a, the UV reprogrammable EEPROMs, the monitor program, all the source code, schematics to the board, and actually the board itself. You could actually figure out what was going on, you could play around with it, and you could see what was inside the computer. Uh, 30 years later, um, not so much that way anymore with uh, computers. We have SOCs with billions of um, transistors, closed source firmware, proprietary designs. So this is sort of what inspired me, got me excited about computers. And I see a lot of value in understanding how the machine is built. And so what I'm going to talk about today is some of the things we're doing at Intel to try to aspire toward that spirit of openness. Um, can't say will be at that level of granularity and everything, but this is really what really got me excited about computers. I um, suspect everyone in the room has their own first computer story too, Commodore 64s, Apples, you know, peeking and poking and basic, and really that's what a lot of us got excited about computers and on modern systems today. We've been pushed up so high, it's kind of hard to play with the machines at that level. And for a lot of reasons, I believe it's important to, again, aspire toward some of that level of openness. So at Intel, the, the way we're sort of looking at this is there are a few vectors. Making it simpler, so a lot of these systems have created a complexity over time, whether it's standards, business requirements, um, the, uh, the supply chain, with some of the folks where, you know, maybe complexity was okay, but as you try to scale to new markets and really let people embrace your technology, you know, what can we do to make things simpler? And then open. I think open, uh, I heard a quote once that if you don't have open source in your business plan, you don't have a business plan. I think it's kind of table stakes in 2019. And so this layer of the system architecture, the firmware, we're above the hardware, we're below the operating system. A lot of security claims being made there. You know, hackers are spending a lot of time poking at that layer because the OS and hypervisor guys are pretty, doing a pretty good job of armoring their, their um, stuff. Sometimes it's harder to write hardware exploits, and so firmware has been an area where they've been able to um, find some interesting results. And then security. So complex, opaque, and that's kind of an opportunity for security guys to jump in, some researchers poke around, figure out how it works themselves, you know, figure out the complexity. Whereas the security angle I, I, uh, I look at is for the good guys, the white hats, the guys building systems, the guys that'll look at your code and give you advice, give you patches. I think open source and by showing people how your machine's built, what your assumptions are, they can, um, they can essentially understand the security posture. And even more so, as we'll show in some of our block diagrams later, the way we do firmware, we do component, um, enabling of components to say turn on our, our hardware blocks, and then people building systems take those hardware blocks, whether it's um, different SOCs, and take some of the firmware and recompose it their own way. So you really have to be, have a security practice of what you do internally building the component and then share that with the people building systems. So the same security claims and intent you have 
they can realize. So I'm gonna sort of drill in on what we're looking at to make things simpler, to make things more open and make things more secure. Um, it's a moving space, and so if you don't see something you were hoping I'd talk about, you can raise your hand when we get there. Or um, since the deck, I didn't sync it up to uh, contemporary to be uh, you know, April 27th. I'm sure stuff happened on April 26th that uh, you might want to know about that I forgot to mention. So I'm always happy to, to talk more. And again, so sort of how we build systems today. We have boundaries where we say, hey, we'll turn on, say, on Intel. We have what we call the south, our um, PCH. The north is typically our CPU. We write code for that, for the platform, maybe the 30 features. And we then historically, um, a lot of the silicon vendors delivering that is, is, whole code, is whole code bases. It's great, it's like a Swiss Army knife. You can pull out the spoon, the fork, but because we want to demonstrate how all the hardware works, how all the features work. But customers may want something simpler. Maybe you're building a tablet or a bonded device or a cloud server. Maybe you only want the code to turn on a couple pieces of hardware, launch the operating system. You don't need the 12 other features in the platform. And so it's kind of not so easy today. So a lot of this has been closed. And then of that closed code, it hasn't been so simple as to find the pieces you need to recompose the subset. So we've heard that message, that it's too complex and it's not open, and so we have efforts we'll talk about to simplify, such as the software model and how we release it. You can realize your different composition and make more of those blocks in the open. So that's the one approach. And, uh, I think a marketing person gave me this slide, so I guess I have an obligatory <laughs> slide here. That's, so if you guys ever saw PowerPoint I started from scratch, which you'll see a couple, there's a, a varying degree of sophistication and skills at drawing pictures, of which I don't really have much sophistication. So again, we're really hearing this and really speaking for just Intel and in general here that we're hearing it not just from the firmware. Um, there's device firmware, for example, there's a project, um, open sound firmware, where a lot of uh, modern systems have a, a DSP, where you can put different audio algorithms. That's historically been closed. Most systems that ship today is closed, but there are efforts to open up that firmware. We gave a great talk on another important component of servers, the baseboard management controller. That's getting opened up. I'm talking about the BIOS, the host firmware. Um, you know, but Intel also has, say, through the Mesa driver, the graphics is open, a lot of our, um, one of the largest contributed Linux kernel. So there are a lot of components that are also getting open. Um, and it's really, it's really, like I said, I think it's a 21st century thing. This is really how you have to do business. And for certain vendors, like if you're a cloud vendor, I remember I went to a tech talk in Kirkland, the Google guys gave, and at the time they mentioned they were using the Oracle database. And I asked the guy, I said, that doesn't sound very googly. He said, but it does some HR thing, you know. So if it goes down, maybe we don't pay our folks for a week or two, but we would never put it on an operational node, right? They have their whole stack, search, Linux, et cetera. Because if, if that goes down, you know, Google not working for a day is probably not acceptable. So they really need open source, or the source code, and preferably open source, for all layers of the stack that are critical. So they can assess it for security considerations, but then fix bugs, debug. So open source is really business driven for a lot of these folks. I think, you know, again, my first slide where, you know, that's, as an engineer, I love to know how things work and BIOS is one of the best things to work on because you see how a machine works, but there's not just that sort of pure interest, there's also really business driven reasons for doing this. I agree, I realize you asked me about that. You offered that I could ask questions. Sure, yeah, thanks, yeah. And um, and I'm 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 all nervous here and listening for this. This is all sounding great. So that means I'll be having the option sometime in the near future of buying a laptop without a management engine. Um. So so yeah, that, that's a good that's a good question. Um. So like I said, there's a vector today. For example, I said there's open sound firmware. I believe the first system you'll see that on in the Chromebook maybe in a couple of years. So I think we're working toward more transparency there, but the timeline on this stuff 
is glacial, to be honest. I started working on EFI in 98, 1998, and um, we got kind of broad, a reasonably broad adoption with Windows 8 2011. It took 13 years. So I'm expressing intent, but I can't commit to when, but that is, we want to be more transparent. And that is a definite concern. And you'll see open source projects like ME Cleaner for people who are more impatient have figured out ways to deprivilege that device. But that is an area we're hearing a lot and is on our um, radar for transparency. Yeah, it's very important. No, that's an important one. I wasn't actually expecting to bring it up, but what, but also what about the Intel network Wi-Fi drive? Yeah, I don't believe there's any open source Wi-Fi drivers other than maybe some reverse engineered an Atheros one. Yeah, they um, closed their AC one. Interesting. So I know our Linux driver, of course, is open and it's in BSD, but there's, like a lot of these components, they have device firmware, whether it's, they call it their microcode or not. And I don't know of any intent to open that. That's actually a good question. Uh, I work with that team. It's, um, and I can I can ask if they have a plan. Probably has something to do with the FCC regulations. Um. Yes, I think that's for all Wi-Fi vendors because if you can hack it, then you can change the power levels. So that's why the Pineapple, for example, they use a, a hacked Broadcom, I believe, so they can. But um. But I think you can be mostly open. So for example, earlier I think someone mentioned about DRM and such. Maybe some things will necessarily be closed for business reasons, but maybe open things that could be open. That's definitely a good question. That's sort of what I was hoping to hear too, because then if I go talk to these guys, I can say, man, I even heard last week where someone asked dot, dot, dot. So <laughs> that's, that's the right question. And, uh, because again, I think we build things for people to buy. And actually, I saw a talk recently that someone said, Intel, you're best when you don't try to do everything, when you build platforms for other people to innovate on. Because we're not an end-to-end -end solution provider. And if people are trying to innovate and build upon what our sort of infrastructure, and these are challenges that you now observe with our infrastructure. It seems like something I, we're not making it as friction free as possible for our customers. So I think it's that's actually good. Um, I think it's actually a really good question. And not surprised by the ME, the Wi Fi one I hadn't thought of recently, so that was good. Um, FSP. FSP? All right, we can get to that one too. Okay. Okay. Um, security. So really um, broadening our security mindset. So one of the things we're also doing, and I think it was mentioned a little in, was it Paul's talk about FWUPD? Um, we're working with um, creating security advisories such that when there are defects in open source, we say, hey, we fixed it, this is where we fixed it. Working with tools like Chipsec, you'll see in a little bit that you can assess your platform, whether it's been um, secured correctly, <clears throat> writing documents to say, this is kind of what we were thinking, these were our security claims, sort of our threat model type stuff. And then a very important one is um, servicing the platform in the field. So we have this concept called a capsule where you can take your firmware update in a well-defined blob um, defined by the UEFI standard and through either Windows Update or the Linux vendor firmware service the equipment, the board manufacturer can release updates. <coughs> and what we're extending the capsule is to more ingredients in the platform, which um, when I show a block diagram of the platform, I'll tell you what we're thinking. Um, so, simplicity. So we asked about the FSP 2.0. So today we have that giant block of Jengas. What FSP is, is essentially a couple of those Jenga blocks that just turn on our hardware. Things that today are considered maybe not ready for open source or for various business reasons we're keeping closed, but there's the logic there is specific to turning on the SOC, like the memory controller. So take a couple of those Jenga blocks to turn on our hardware and say, can we build the rest of the solution in the open? So we're doing this FSP and we'll show in a picture. A slim bootloader for IoT guys that just want enough code to turn on a platform and boot Linux. It's, a, it's enough C code that can wrap an FSP as an example and then launch Linux from Flash. And then the min platform architecture. So the Jenga blocks, maybe 30 of those blocks are all the different components in a platform, all of our features. What are the minimum of those Jenga blocks you need to boot Linux or Windows? 
So we're sort of decomposing the stack in a little tiny pieces so you can build the sparser picture on the right, the, the sparser Jenga blocks. And then openness. Really put full platforms out there. So it started in 98, we had the EFI spec and we had something called the reference implementation. It was the generic high level code. It was, didn't work on any platform other than you could, it could make BIOS calls underneath so you could work on top of a BIOS. And 20, 2005, we open sourced a BIOS core, SourceForge then went to Git. And since then, we've been actually trying to put platforms out there. So you could take the code and build a full solution. Ron Minnick from the Linux BIOS project used to call us a sham open source project because um, you couldn't build a full solution. And I actually had dinner with him and I quoted him and his face got red and he said, I never said that. And I said, well, you said it and it was kind of true. So we're trying to unsham the project a little, put full platforms out there. That's fine. You know, I, I, the way my philosophy with those guys, um, especially open source guys, they always hit you with the big stick. But don't take it personally, the impact from the stick. Look at the, the guy with the stick and say, why is he aiming it at you? And why is he swinging it so hard? And they're usually good reasons, right? It's, if he's not even throwing anything at you it means maybe you're not relevant. So it's a relevant area and he's concerned. And so like peel it back and say, okay, he cares. And so um, I think and that's, that's a response we've really been trying to work on the last uh, five or six years. I mentioned the sound firmware because that's one of the first examples where we took one of these little tiny um, SOC device firmware hidden deep in the chipset and have some proof point that it can be open, but it's still early days. And then MicroPython, namely, Someone was telling me, uh, like, if you want to get an intern to work on EFI, say you're going to write a bunch of C code, it may not excite them so much, so maybe use some more modern dynamic languages to do testing and other things. So we're putting MicroPython out there so you can test your firmware. And then a specific Python um, framework called Chipsec, which essentially what this tool was born of is we show up in Black Hat a lot. A lot of attacks attack EFI for this. There's some talk it, you know, um, troopers on EFI. And so what we've done is we said they would announce a, a vulnerability. And we do advisories, people would fix their code. But if you're an end user buying um, one of your PCs, how do you know it's fixed? So Chipsec is an assessment tool that with Python plugins to take some of those exploits and see if the platform has done the mitigation. If it's software probable, like maybe one of the flaws was you forgot to lock, set a lock register that left an asset exposed, like system management RAM, there'll be a chipset module that look at that register and say, hey, your BIOS didn't set this. Or are you EFI variables? A lot of folks didn't um, do as diligent a job to see if they were well formed. They might fuzz the variable store and say, hey. And so this has been growing over time. And the nice thing is if there's a talk you can say, we can list the 50 you know, talks or whatever and say, is there a chipsec? Um, or when we do a security advisor, do we write a chipsec plugin? And then the other one I mentioned is capsules. This one's really important um, to us because really BIOS updates. So if you want to update your machine today, do you go to the OEM website and have to run a weird tool or do you even get BIOS updates? So the idea here is to have a well-known format this binary blob with a GUID where the vendor will create that'll have their updates and then it can be sent through Windows Update or this Linux vendor firmware service. So essentially, BIOS or firmware updates should become like OS updates, meaning seamless, you don't have to see what's going on. And then this thing can then be targeted to finer granularity. Today, most vendors will update their whole BIOS image, but we have lots of components, those Jenga blocks I showed. Maybe one of those Jenga blocks is our core microcode. Maybe another Jenga block is our graphics driver from Intel within the BIOS. We can, we can evolve to a world where we can deliver many of these capsules. So the vendor can either take them himself and bundle them up big, or maybe in a future point, we can have a capsule with maybe the latest microcode that can go straight to your BIOS. There's a lot of business issues there where people worry, hey, if I update only one Jenga block, not all of them, will they work together? So not claiming we'll hit that nirvanic endpoint, but we're doing a lot of investments to say, can you service 
at least start any machine out there with this host firmware and then get to even at some point updating components of the host firmware. So that's one of our big focuses. Um, but it's challenging. So we're not a monolith. We're not like a single binary release called Windows. The firmware that's on your motherboard is maybe curated from open source, vendor proprietary, code from some other silicon vendors. And so, and it's not just the host firmware. So I mentioned the BIOS is the code that runs on, say, the x86 or, you know, a class ARM CPU that sort of drives the main OS. We have the peripheral firmware. You mentioned the Wi Fi, your disk controller. I, I believe a friend, uh, Jan Mosch, when he did his talk on um, some of the firmware supply chain issues, mentioned like a Pixel Book will have 16 updatable firmware elements in addition to the host firmware in your bio. So. And they all have their own processors. There's threat models of can this one talk to that one? And all of this stuff is pretty highly privileged, right? Your AV software can't really see what's going on in your firmware today. And then you can build host firmware different ways. EFI is, is one way, um, but there's core boot, U boot, Linux boot, FSP, which I'll show um, a little later. So it's not just fix this one thing, there's various ways to actually build your host firmware. But I believe, um, the future is open, and so I did this quote from a, uh, wrote this book with some Google and Facebook, or Google engineers, and I think, like I mentioned earlier, why the large, the cloud companies want to have it all open, they want to work in communities, they want to have observability, I think it ex the same, a lot of those same properties extend to, um, to PCs and servers in general. And so, here I'll telescope a little, little deeper see my time check here, uh, it's probably okay. Um, so what we're doing, um, having an open development environment. I think, so to build your firmware, you need a lot of things, you need a core. And this is the basic code for my UEFI example that'll provide basic generic UEFI services. It's all pure C code software. Underneath that is code that has understanding of the specific platform. How are the GPIOs interrupt routed? What's the power management strategy? What's the logo you want to see when it boots up? You know, what's the user presentation management? There's stuff that touches, has to have platform cognizance. And then we realize today we can't have everything open. So if we do have to have some of these sort of painful blobs, have a well-defined way to, to do the blob. And then tools. So if I give you a core, I give you platform code, I give you some magic sauce to finally light it up. If I don't give you the tools to put it all together, to understand how on an Intel chipset there's a thing called an SPI descriptor that has magic bits that tell the chipset different policy, you can't build the final solution. So I need to give you a core platform code, magic initialization code, and tools to sort of um, pour it all together, have a recipe. And this is how we've been approaching the industry and what we're trying to scale out even further. Specifically, so we have this thing called an Intel FSP, um, where it's on GitHub now, github.com slash Intel FSP. So that's where we put these magic binaries that turns on, say, our memory controllers, so your DRAM. And then at that same place, we put a document called a um, platform integration guide. And it says, hey, here are all the magic settings that you can do to make this purple code do what you need for your platform. So the FSP is specific to our SOC. You can go crazy, do your own board design, and then open source everything else. So the green part on the left is our UEFI core. A lot of our class drivers, USB, NVMe, things that should work on industry standards. Everything there is open source, and then any code to do platform specific things. This could be board specific code, or it could be drivers that are unique to that. SOC, but we're able to open source. And then the UEFI spec is really just a property of that code. It's a set of interfaces. And the reason you want, some people elect to have things like UEFI and companion spec called ACPI. Sometimes people say, ah, oh, why, why is it so complex to boot? On that left side, a lot of the OS vendors want to write one OS that works in every platform. So if you're Microsoft or you're RHEL, Red Hat, 
you want to build one OS image, and then the OS loader looks at these interfaces to put itself in memory. It looks at these interfaces to figure out how to initialize its kernel. And you don't have to build an OS per board. And so that's sort of what made the PC happen starting in 82 with the, um, with the BIOS. And now UEFI is kind of the new BIOS thing. Industry standards allow you to do shrink wrap OSs. So you can buy a PC that boots you know, hundreds of OSs. But at the same time, you may build a product that you don't need necessarily out of the factory to boot every OS. Maybe you want to make different claims like the right side of Chromebook. So Chromebooks, Google signs all the code, it puts Chrome OS there, and they can make a lot of claims because they can say, hey, look, we know everything in your boot path, we know everything in your kernel. Maybe it's a bit they can say, you know, it's kind of like they can make claims about um, you know, security claims about that. And I think that's fine. But the underneath the code to at least initialize our silicon and FSB makes the same and then work with the core boot community. So the equivalent of the platform drivers, which is RAM stage, um, work with them to have that in the open. And then in Talee's question of the FSP, that's in the middle. That typically has three parts. One to turn on our caches to run C code before memory. Another part that turns on the memory controller and a third part to turn on we call it um, silicon in it. It turns on our CPU, it talks to our management engine. Some of those flows aren't public today. And so the initial flow to turn on temporary RAM, Google has open sourced and they don't use it, FSPT. FSPM is still used, and then some of what's in FSPS we would like to open source. So essentially over time we would like to make the FSP smaller to go to zero such that its capabilities are in open source. So there is an effort to open more, and principally, TempRAM is most people use in the open, and then the silicon in it, we're working to open more of that. So I guess this is the next click down again, and um, in a few weeks, there'll be actually an FSP 2.1 for some other things we're doing, but to make this essentially more portable. But again, this is kind of a dilation again into um, how we're doing this. We have a specification for these FSPs, we put them on the web, and then we're open sourcing the platform code for the EDK2 style UEFI solution. So if you go to github.com slash TNO core slash EDK2, you can find the core, and then the platform code is on the EDK2 platform. Put all of that in the open, and then we have, um, it's actually called the min platform specification, a way to write that platform code. And there you'll see platforms, code for things like these middle boards that I think Barry showed, an E3800, the upboard. We have code for a uh, Cabulate, a big core client, and I think some patches have just been submitted for a System76 laptop. So we're essentially not much. You know, if people say, hey, I just bought the latest OEM XYZ board, can I rebuild the BIOS for that board directly from Tiano Core? We're not yet there yet. We're sort of building the infrastructure that it could be done, and then trying to find boards that are public to demonstrate this, but it's still early days. Um, and then servers. So we've gotten a lot of feedback from servers, the cloud guys, that you know the rest of their stack is open. Why isn't the host firmware? And so there's a project um, called the Open Compute. This was started um, I think driven initially by Facebook, where a lot of what they did in their data center, they shared it. So they could go to equipment manufacturers and say, hey, build me a machine based on these specifications, you know, these thermals, this power supply, and work directly with vendors. And so that's been pretty successful. Um, OpenDMC, as Lee mentioned, is part of um, Open Compute. And so we started a work stream called Open System Firmware with a boot code. You know, collaborate with the cloud vendors on what they need for the actual um, host firmware to be open. And then we have binaries already for um, some of the small core, our client Atom devices and our big core devices. And again, I mentioned the open source core. And then for core boot, there's a pretty rich collection of, um, of 
I Intel architecture based code because Chromebooks have been um, Intel based Chromebooks have all used Core Boot and then some of our microservers like for telecom we have Core Boot and these leverage FSP also. So we're open, we're not open everywhere, this whole supply chain's not open yet, but we're putting proof points out. So sort of that vision of, you know, 98, we just had some basic reference code with no platforms. The mid-2000s where we had full-featured BIOS cores with not so many platforms, to today with full platforms, but not many of them. Uh, that's kind of where we're at today. Um, and then, again, this is um, from from the open compute where, again, this work stream where some of the cloud guys want to integrate Linux directly in Flash and do something different than a full EFI solution. Some vendors want to do EFI. And so really a model where let the cloud guys make their choice and provide them the option. And we did a port to one of the um, OCP boards and we have work in progress on getting a lot of the um, tools out there to build the full platform. I mentioned great to have the code, but if you don't have the tools to you know, stitch all the code together, you can't build the full solution. And then another thing, we got some feedback from the community that we have these FSP binaries, but given our corporate history of you know, conservatism, these binaries said things like, you know, give us your firstborn child and don't do things with them, and there are a lot of constraints. And so the, the core boot and other guys said, hey, we want to copy these, put them in our own repos, manage them. So based on the community feedback, we changed the license so that really just the license says, you know, don't, no warranty, don't um, do bad things with them, but, you know, hey, it's your hardware, put them where you want and manage them where you want. So. We've been listening to the community and trying to um, evolve our practices based on community input. And then, but there are challenges. So the tools. So on a modern platform today, there are quite a bit of tools. Some are Windows only. They do magic things to sort of provision your image. So we're still on a path to free up the tools. And then freeing up that silicon code. So the way I look at the Intel FSP, I said it's a binary blob but it's kind of a soft lockdown. And what I mean by that is it's not you know, encrypted or compressed through some proprietary thing. If you ran this assembler, you can see what it's doing. And it's not signed, so the hardware doesn't say, oh, you're not using the FSP. And so two paths you can always go. If it really needed to be protected in hard lockdown, you can sign it, make it such that it decompresses itself and only runs in a cache. That's kind of the gold standard to hide stuff or open it, and we're more on the path of the latter, right? It just turns on our hardware, and we're really just working through our processes with product teams to um, get the documentation and approval out there. And speaking of documentation, you know, we're in a world today where we create documentation, either it's the NDA source that we give people, it's the code is the documentation, or the documentation comes out much later. And so if you want to do open source and do development more in the open, you have to have this documentation out there. And then in this intermediate world where we're going to spouse to people, hey, use some of these binaries, but we're not going to give you all the code yet. We've got to have stories so these guys can debug. So it's, it's, and what we do today is in our FSP integration guide, we put an appendix that says, hey, we'll write to this location with these error codes in case bad things happen. But that's not necessarily ideal. So we've got to give folks, if we're going to have binaries, I would argue a better way to debug them. Question? Sure. What does EDS mean? Oh, in external design specifications. Oh, okay. that's good. <laughs> I missed that TLA. <laughs> At Intel, actually, when I started, there were all these TLAs. <laughs> and, I, first time. and I thought, it's like, what's TLA, right? So it's even yeah. <laughs> It's, 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 it's a big company. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and then again, really want to sort of tie it up here and show you that picture I mentioned earlier of all the different ways to boot. You know, my, my belief is you know, people should have choice on how they boot. So the more traditional model is at the top. We have these well-defined phases of execution. We have industry standards. This is what we do a lot of our enabling. And it gives you a full EFI 
um, experience where you can run all of these different operating systems. But if you're doing embedded, maybe you want smaller firmware, more fixed purpose, and you have one OS target. And then what we've heard from some of the cloud guys is this. You know, maybe they, the Skynet they built only runs Linux. It's in their data center behind locked doors. Do they need that rich firmware at the top when they're only going to boot one OS? And when they have a lot of concerns about you know, debug, maybe they want something that they're very familiar with. And so one example I heard from one um, data center guy said, you know, I have a one UEFI engineer and 1,100 Linux engineers. So if they want Linux to help do the boot for them, I think that's fine. So what we should do is ensure that the infrastructure code around that makes it possible and you know, engage in a community fashion with them. So yeah, from when I started, uh, you know, in the, in the old days, it was BIOS was the only game in town, a PCAT BIOS. We figured out how to encapsulate the BIOS, do our rich EFI experience. Core Boot was sort of a few embedded folks. Now Core Boot's pretty broad, and Linux Boot's coming up. And there's probably six more of these Slim diagrams people do that maybe aren't community-based firmware. I mentioned the Slim Boot loader is one, but you know, and so my view is things like an FSP or silicon code, maybe be consistent on that. Um, you know, binary today, maybe open source in the future, so that you at least have some consistency, but let the community decide how else they want to build their platform. And then finally, sort of the path to openness. So we've started and all closed. That's been kind of our historical um, MO. And then moving sort of an open source core. So the, the mid 2000s, we pretty much put a full featured core out there. So if you think of the arc, it's probably um, the, the 90s were all closed. Mid 2000s was our second stop on the train here for um, open sourcing a core. And now we're sort of you know, at the middle of the, of the journey here. We have an open source core, we're putting open source platform code and the binary. And at this point, in the um, publicly, you can build some platforms out of collateral on the web. No, no signing of NDAs. But it's not ideal because there's still magic blobs. There's some tools. Like certain tools, we don't have open, so we have to put some pre-canned binaries that people link in. It's not ideal. And so our next steps we're tacking toward is um, we still keep the open source core, our platform code, and then this FSP, sort of responding to Lee's question, is sort of treated, um, we call it the SST SDK, but really what it means is our FSP, so when you saw that Django blocks, that FSP is like within it a bunch of Django blocks. We'll have a module to turn on feature X, a module to turn on feature Y, a module to turn on feature Z. Start making more of those modules open, so even if there's an FSP binary in there you can drop in, you'll also be able to find parts of that FSP more actually delivered in open source and then fewer binaries. And then as we sort of chip away more source to fewer binaries, fewer goes to zero. And so the arc we're really on right now is you know, scaling the middle, because also if you have a recipe like the middle for one market segment but not another, a customer will say, you know, we want to have a common workflow. They think your company is one company. They're not going to want to hear a different story from different divisions. Scale the middle and then work toward um, opening um, the FSP up to a point where at least the host firmware is all open. You may still have you know, blobs for power management controllers. Things like our core microcode patches may, may, may not ever get open, but Things, and the reason I think host firmware is very important is as follows. The people who build these boards, <coughs> this is the code they change. Maybe a power management controller deep in the chipset they would never have to change, so maybe it's not sort of the same urgency, but I'd argue any of the code they have to change, they may elect to change, or may want to do one of those different boot flows. They should have choice, so I think that's why getting the host um, firmware open is so important. And to really sort of give talks like this to get some good questions I could get earlier and feedback from folks, 
But um, you know, again, trying to keep it simple. You know, having to read 3,000 pages and crawl through 2.5 million lines of code isn't going to necessarily um, qualify as simple. Open, you know, no NDAs. You can go to the web. You know, innovate and not tell anyone. That's great, right? You know, if you want to use the hardware, you should be able to use the hardware as you see fit. And then security. I mean, the world's gotten really complex. There's tens of thousands of registers in, in modern SOCs. These firmware stacks go from several hundred thousand lines to maybe a million to build a platform. So we really have to be a lot more transparent on our security claims, our security features, and then give people an option in the ecosystem a way to service these things. I think it's silly to say, write perfect code, there'll never be bugs. Assume there'll always be bugs, assume there'll always be exploits. So have a good servicing model and coordination model where you can um, fix them with the community. And um, that's pretty much it. Uh, if I were to ask anything to folks, give feedback on the directions, whether in venues like this, or if you're, you know, we have an open source community, Stefano Satola. I think he's a great guy to reach out to or get on mailing lists. If you want to play with standards, that's a little more, we're trying to move to be more open in our standards process. It's historically been behind closed doors. We're trying to even do some of our standards work. Where did the UEFI spec go? And I think a great example I saw recently was in the UEFI 2.8 spec. There was a, um, a proposal to remove the need for EFI runtime services. That's kind of been a bane of our existence. You know, having firmware code live in the kernel. How do you share hardware? Hackers love to beat it up. And so Peter Jones at Red Hat made a change request but it's like in a markdown file on GitHub before, you know, so he, he could get um, community input before he took it to the standards. I see how he has a recent one. I haven't got looked too closely yet, but uh, I think it's great. I think things should be in the open. You shouldn't have special clubs of folks who decide to fade a platform. And I think when people buy hardware, they should be able to do what they want with it. And with that, um, Back. Oh, you're back. <laughs> By the way, thank you very much. This is all wonderful. The, uh, the direction that you're talking about sounds good, if not possibly your inference of the timeline. Uh, but uh, uh, the the part of the evil management engine uh, is is still really hidden in your presentation, and and I mean that's a separate processor that's running there causing trouble. And, and I'm wondering if the clients who want that, I assume big corporations like that to manage their, their uh, fleets of computers or whatever, um, if you open this up, that may get in the way of their idea of, of being able to lock down their hardware. Whereas the rest of us who don't like that vulnerability sitting around uh, would like to not have it. I ask, first question, why can't we have that now? And then the next question is, how can you in an open environment where you yeah. make the, them happy? No, no, I think you bring up a good point. And an openness on things like that are, are a challenge. So for example, like, a, like a, some ARM SOCs will have code that's built on the die to call it their boot ROM that end users can't change. But what they do sometimes is publish it. So one thing you can do is provide more transparency. Maybe it's locked down because you don't want different behavior, but at least give people maybe more transparency. That's one thing you could do. I mean, and then another is separation of duty. Maybe have the richer features skewable or separate from the basic features. And I believe from Dell, on their website, someone showed me you can pay an extra $25 to have the AMT feature turned off on a PC. I don't have any opinion on the business dynamics, but there, there are. From everything I've heard about that, that was Dell reverse engineering and hacking it out. I, I don't recall. But, okay. And then, but I think one of the reasons you do have these type of controllers, I think uh, Lee mentioned AMD's PSP. A lot of modern platforms have these controllers because sort of very rude things before you can even start running code on the main CPUs, like phase lock loops and other things. Sure. You need some little guy to do magic. And then with Windows 8, there was a requirement for hardware roots of trust, meaning some agency to say, has the flash been tampered with? because there's always a competition between <clears throat> openness and user control and security. Meaning if I sell a machine, I have a social trust to say, hey, 
you know, it's a Acme Computer Corp. It is Acme Computer Corp's BIOS running, and their brand is saying it's safe. There's trust is off some, sometimes based on business factors, right? Well, that lockdown machine means maybe I, as an end user, can't put my own firmware in there. So protection versus end user owner change. And what Chromebooks do is they have a different threat model that says if you can touch it with a screwdriver for more than five minutes, you can actually change it. You can unright protect the ROM and put your own in there. And then maybe these higher level things like attestation. But yeah, I think it's the I think it, the message has been um, conveyed, and I think. Um, in, this, in the spirit of transparency and the concerns that have been brought up by a lot of these hacks, looking at it, that's just a different part of my very large company. But I think it, but you shouldn't have to worry about my org chart. You shouldn't see the org chart when I'm talking to no. you. No, you're talking to the company. And so I'll take that feedback. I agree. If you didn't see it today, you should watch Kyle Rankin's uh, from Purisms. Oh, did they give a talk? They gave a talk. It was oh. real good. And, and it was clear that, because uh, I asked him the specific question, he didn't know anything, know anything about any of this openness at all. In fact, I asked him specifically, why isn't Intel something helping you or working with you at all? Yeah, if he's here, is he down in the booth? Maybe I'll go talk to him. I know, but he gave a presentation. He gave a presentation. Okay. Oh, sorry. Related to that, um, Purism, I think, is a source licensee of the FSP, and one thing it did, they did was change it so it disabled the NT management engine. Um, it might be interesting for your future FSP to make that as an option so there's a library function for sure. OEMs that want to enable it and one that don't want to That's enable it. That's actually a good point. That could be a, we would call them our UPDs, which are APIs that the trusted platform and encode calls. That's actually a good suggestion. Make it a UPD. Okay. I didn't realize the purism guys were here. I'll look them up then. No, I think, um, yeah, and, and, and part of it is is corporate business requirements versus open transparency. It's always a competition and you don't want it to be reactive, like to put out fires of some issue, you do it, you do it proactively because you're trying to be customer oriented and customers are asking. So I think it's good feedback. And I hadn't read the Purism guys' latest blogs and efforts, so that's pretty interesting that that's part of their product. Okay. They had some FSP blogs and they pulled them. Um, I have so no, you can't read them. I have no comments on that. <laughs> that wasn't me, but that's all I can sure. So regarding SGX, uh, my understanding is that the only way you can upload a program to the SGX, uh, the memory enclave, is that you have to have uh, the program signed by Intel internally. That, that was, I think, first generation of SGX was Skylight. I think later generations, they have launch control, which is allows you to have different signing enclaves. But you're right, first generation, that was true. Yes. So can I, so I can, uh, with the newer generation, I could then upload my own uh, program signed by myself? You create your own signing enclave, which is like the own authority. And this launch controlled MSR is, is, is essentially, you program early in the platform life to say, this is the hash of King Enclave. In the past, it was freeze right in. And I hope I don't get in trouble, because I, Lord, if I can tell you which CPU, but I believe the MSR is public. but. I can't tell you product names because I get confused between what's public and what's. But yes, Memo was heard on that. And SGX had its own evolution, but now there is um, owner controlled um, signing enclave, so you don't have to have Intel sign your content. But I believe first generation Skylake, that is the case. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to make sure there was some uh, feedback on that because that, that's a good, that's I don't good. want to return to the next uh, IME. No, and in fact, some people ask me, hey, add a UEFI interface to manage that thing. I said, I don't think we'll do it well. With the OS's or someone. <laughs> we don't have a great track record of it takes us a long time to do things in BIOS. So our other philosophy I didn't say is anything you can do outside of the BIOS and an OS, we're all in. Like PCI enumeration. Today on a on a modern PC or server, you have to enumerate this bus called PCI peripheral component interconnect and say where all the resources are. Mm -hmm. Most modern OS's do it again. We're slow, we're not the best software people in the world. We just do enough to get to the boot device, and we're say we're out. We don't need a piece of hardware for booting. We don't touch. We think less BIOS is better BIOS, because that's not what customers want, right? Customers want to get to an OS and do stuff. Firmware, if you see the, the BIOS, we always say it's a broken BIOS, because we're supposed to boot in a second or two. So if you see that there is firmware and you're interacting with it, it's probably because something went bad. Um, and then when I started this project too, we built this extensibility, all those Jenga blocks, and people said, oh, there could be all these value add, we could add 
you know, web browsers in our BIOS and Bitcoin miners. And, and what I've finally come to the, the, the belief is BIOS is value neutral when you win, I meaning no one cares. And it can only be value negative if it's either slow to boot, it has bugs, or it's complex to use. And so my job is kind of make it value neutral. If no one ever talked about it again, then it, it's a score, right? The open source people could see enough of it they want. They don't complain on Foronix that Core Boot's doing more than this other one, or I can't have my blog posted because of, <laughs> just don't talk about it. So my job is just to get people to talk about it, and I'll go do something else. So. <laughs> but yeah, that, but the SGX feedback's good, and I'll, I'll double check on the MSR. If you hit me, send me a DM on Twitter or an email, I'll, I'll, I'll look up what the actual CPU family is, if it's Are you on the AC IRC server? The who? Huh? The OTC IRC server? I don't do IRC. OTC? Yeah. IRC? No, OTC. OTC. Intel and kernel. Oh, no. Just say Slack or something. Yeah, Slack's mine. <laughs> no, I'm not even good with that. I'm old. I don't do much social media. Okay. Even Twitter's a stretch for me. So. <laughs> that was a good, good question. Any other? Uh, okay, then I think I'll emancipate you guys to actually enjoy. Bellingham and the rest of this talk and not look at PowerPoint and look at something more